Well, you know, I've just been here a couple of hours and the perception has been um, a lot of technology. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, I'm happy to see that no matter what level of business they're thinking about, whether it's agriculture and or um, solar or things of that nature, they're also applying technology. Um, social cause related, a lot of individuals that have really strong beliefs in changing not only uh, the empowerment of themselves with, in regards to uh, to money and, right. and financial freedom, but they also want to change something that is going on in the environment, in the community. So, right. so really, really amazing people. When we talk about entrepreneurship and startups, the startup culture in Africa, there's always a conversation of how do I value my business? Yeah. And for a lot of young people watching this will be, that's the question they, they keep asking. How do you go about saying my business is worth this much? You know, uh, you know, when people watch Shark Tank, we have to have uh, evaluation put there for the simplicity of the show. Um, and, you know, we have this big gap here. You know, with technology, there's this super high valuation that people are believing, you know, they just start something in a week, that they're worth $2 right. billion, dollars, right? Uh, and then with me, where, you know, I made uh, hard goods and soft goods, the valuation is pretty, pretty simple. You know, I make something for $10, I sell it for $20, I do an X amount of business. You know, the valuation is probably depends on who you are looking to partner with. Um, in an exit, right. a, a total exit, there's a very clear valuation. It's four times, six times, eight times, whatever the industry's going at. But when you're partnering with somebody, what is the other person bringing a value? If it's just hard capital, then you can find an easy level of valuation. But if somebody's bringing uh, manufacturing, uh, distribution, right. sales, other things like that, I tend to take lower valuation, uh, you know, if I was an owner, I'd take lower valuation in those type of companies because somebody is a very smart, they're smart money and they're strategic partners. Right. So very, very hard. The value is almost, you, you, you put on a value as much as you need and or as much as the person's worth. It's, right. it's like a marriage. Right. Earlier on in the panel, you mentioned uh, an attraction to entrepreneurs who failed before. Yes. And I guess this is a question you've had 10,000 times. What makes a successful entrepreneur? A successful entrepreneur is somebody that, first of all, failed several times and they've learned the things not to do. Uh, somebody who's failed several times and they still have a passion and dream for it right. and they were able to rebound from it. A, pa a person who's failed many times and they now have surrounded themselves with like-minded people and right. or mentors and who, who has uh, access to now what they need to go forward and now all they need after that is maybe capital or a strategic partner um, and those are the type of people that I like people that also are problem solvers not problem creators right. you know if we're partners on something and there's a problem I want you to call me and I want you to say I tried these eight things they didn't work out but these last two why don't, why don't we work on it together and we're both gonna learn and we're both gonna move forward and we're gonna fail together or succeed together right Access to credit is obviously top of conversations whenever you're meeting early stage entrepreneurs and they will say, I cannot access credit. Are there lessons that we can learn? Because I, I'm assuming access to credit problems are across the globe. Yeah. What lessons can uh, early stage entrepreneurs in Kenya learn from elsewhere? Well, you know, I, I, I always talk about, um, I was just on a panel and I was sharing with them when I first couldn't find credit and I had about $50,000 in orders. What I did was, I, uh, I had about $50,000 in orders and I went over to a t-shirt manufacturer and you know they were maybe making my shirt at $7 mm -hmm. and I asked them, I said, you know what, if you can just ship directly to the store, I'll pay you $8.50 and then I went over to the store and I had the store pay them directly and they shipped directly to the store and I didn't have to give up any of my company. I paid a little bit more of the product and mm -hmm. made a little bit less of profit right. but then my, my loss factor was very low and people have to think very, very, they have to think out of the box. They right. have to become creative. You know, they have to, as I always say, exercise what we call the power of broke and find right. other opportunities. You know, one thing I always share with people is the earlier you ask for capital, uh, and if you don't have a proof of concept, the more the capital costs. Right. So what you have to do is really sometimes not try to sell 200, 500, a million dollars worth of stuff. Sell $50,000 with a clean, $20,000 with a clean profit and turn it back over. People often want to grow too quickly, right. and that's not that's that's not smart to grow too quickly because first of all, you then leave a lot of opportunity for failure. If you have somebody else's capital at risk as well as your own, you can potentially lose it all on one shot. Right. 
You know, you don't want you don't want a hundred thousand dollars worth of goods coming in at one time. Right. You want ten thousand coming in ten different times so that the whole thing, unless it, if it was a inferior goods, you don't have a hundred thousand dollars worth of goods worth of bad goods to sell. Right. So, first of all, grow slow. Second of all, find alternative motives and alternative ways to finance your. Mm -hmm. your growth right the angel investor culture in kenya is just speaking up it's actually it's in its infancy how do you get the private sector excited about innovation well how do i get the private well first of all what's in it for them i mean bottom line is you know often people that are uh, they have a company they have ideas and concepts it's me 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 i need you to fund me because i want to do this no matter what what's in it for the person that you are asking for the capital from right. or their strategic relationship. Bottom line, we all, investors, you, I, anybody else, we all have our own hopes and dreams and mm -hmm. aspirations as well. And often people go out there and they just are focused on what they want. Strategic investors and or investors, they often don't necessarily want return on capital. Maybe right. they want to be part of a movement that helps uh, helps agriculture. Right. right. Maybe they want to give back in some other way. Maybe they want to Maybe they do want a small return on capital, but a consistent return, or maybe they want to be partners in something. So you always have to find out what's in it for the investors. And, right. and that's what I've noticed where people make their biggest mistakes. Right. They're, they're so concentrated on what they need and that they don't think about what the investor needs. Do you see a role, if any, that the government can play in sort of stirring this up? Well, I think one of the biggest roles they're playing is now bringing all these eyeballs on, you know, uh, uh, from all around the world and all these investors from around the world here for, for GES. Um, I think that, yes, if there's ways that they can offer some more accelerators and incubators and spaces that they may have to, to put like-minded people together to, to work and feed off each other, um, can they bring maybe, uh, uh, maybe some more curriculums into the, into the school system to talk mm -hmm. about financial intelligence? Because right. often, sometimes the biggest problem about investing is, I want to invest in a company, but you never paid your taxes. You, 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 I can't tell where the, the money's going so or how it's going to be. entrepreneurs need to do their due diligence Of course, first. you have to be ready to take in funding. You know, because if I'm looking at five different uh, companies and they all are equal, right. the three that don't know how to take in capital and I won't know if you own the trademark, you know, when am I going to get my capital out, have you been paying your taxes, I'm not going to look at those. I'm going to look at the other two. Mm -hmm. So the foundation of the companies need to be there. and. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs often need to understand how to set up and just the basics, just the simple, I'm not asking about big things, just the basic, simple way to set up their companies. Right. You obviously hear a lot of pitches in your line of work. What do you think, and this is an unfair question, is the next disruptor in terms of a brilliant technology coming out of whatever part of the world? Um, it will be an energy play, I believe. I believe the next disruptor is going to be some form of energy. Uh, be, and. And I think also in the banking area where it's, you know, when these individuals, especially here, who, who, who uh, you know, how they learn to, to trade and or uh, loan money through, uh, through the phone system, right. right? I think that, I think this uh, region is setting a, a, a great example for how you can empower people, number one, make money, number two. Um, I think those are the two areas. It's going to be banking and it's going to be...